The following podcast was recorded the morning of Tuesday, January 12th, 2021. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or biancoresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. In addition to podcasts, we also offer a conference call format. Please contact us for further details. Thanks for your time and enjoy today's podcast. Welcome to the latest edition of Talking Data. Our Talking Data series seeks to offer timely insights into macro market themes along with macro data and its impact on the economy and markets. I'm Kristen Reddish of Arbor Research and Trading and I will be your host. Our presenters are Jim Bianco of Bianco Research and Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Today we will be discussing real yields. The U.S. Treasury yields refuse to budge. Ben, we're going to start with you. What is steering extremely low real yields? Is it the Federal Reserve? Is it economic growth? Please give us your thoughts. So we've seen this, obviously, a, a tremendous spread and difference now between what we call nominal and real yields. And that's what's created this, what's known as tips break evens or inflation expectations. And those have all risen above 2%, meaning we're kind of expecting 2 plus percent inflation. So we're kind of at this critical juncture that's brought up this topic and had individuals focusing on nominal yields all look how high 10-year yields are now breaking above 100 basis points or one percent um, but on the flip side real yields which in this case jim uh, brought up a good point before the call that we should talk about what we're talking about here with real yields uh real yields our focus is in tips which are treasury inflation protection securities that are going to then have be swayed and pushed around by market forces to a certain degree the issue just like treasuries uh, that then have a CPI accrual, uh, have the benefit of, of an income from CPI um, each year. Rel now we can compare that to how some economists and people, uh, particularly in the equity markets, look at real yields is essentially the 10-year note yield or 30-year bond yield minus the year-of-year -year change in CPI. Uh, that is kind of more backward looking and obviously kind of has, um, you know, doesn't update on a daily basis. So here we're focusing on 10 year real yields and what's moving them and causing extremely low yields is the Fed. So the Fed controls the real yield um, to a very large degree. And that's been increasing in nature since the financial crisis in 2010. And if we look at Fed communications and we have a chart here, we'll actually pull up that shows Fed sentiment, uh, looking at all their statements, speeches, testimonies, pressers, and so on, their sentiment is actually the most uh, kind of uh, pessimistic and least enthusiastic uh, we've really seen in their history. We can compare that then to their degree of uncertainty uh, with words of you know, how ambiguous is their, um, their language, how clear then is their communications, um, and that uncertainty is at the lowest in history, meaning they're as clear as ever. So the Fed is committed to low interest rates. Powell says so. That has keeping real yields and specifically also the short end of the curve at rock bottom level. So two year real yields are around negative 225 basis points. The 10 years just above inside negative 100 basis points. And we can explain that those changes in these real yields using just simply the Fed sentiment and uncertainty. And we can explain in the 68 plus percent of the variation in them. So until the Fed decides to get concerned, maybe they see a higher degree of uncertainty and their communication becomes difficult to discern, which means there'd be maybe a lack of agreement until we see that, or we see an increase in hawkish rhetoric. These real yields will remain low and those are what's steering I think, uh, risk assets. So if they remain low, risk assets do okay, even in the face of rising nominal yields to a certain degree. Um, so what do you think about that, Jim? Yeah, I, I'd agree with you that the Fed is definitely a big player here. Now, normally, you know, in a textbook environment, you would look at real yields as akin to the market's opinion about real growth, right? When real yields go up, the market thinks you're having more real growth, and when they go down, you would have less real growth. But that's the textbook environment, and that's absolutely what we are not in right now. <laughs> You've got the Fed playing in this market. As you point out with your chart, they are very they are very pessimistic and very certain about their pessimism. And in March of last year, the Fed owned 20 or 8%, excuse me, of the tips market. 
Then through all the QE that we've had through, uh, throughout the pandemic shutdown and reopening, they've gone to 20%. They are far and away the biggest player in that market as well too. So the Fed, you know, not only wants real yields to be at a certain level, they're also the biggest player in that market and they can set those uh, real yields at those levels. And right now, as your chart shows, they are setting them at very, very low levels right now. Yeah, and that also helps explain some of the, the strange things we've seen uh, in the marketplace. So one could be the zombie story. So low real yields or real yields in general have a strong connection to the percentage of zombie companies that are around in the S&P 1500, which currently is somewhere around 16%. Uh, I think we show about 650 individual companies that are deemed zombies, which are less than, um, we're EBIT to interest expense ratios are less than one and market caps are above 300 million. And so as these real yields gyrate, if they're stable or they fall, that means that we can have money moving into the riskier of risk assets. And that's why I've seen zombie companies outperform by an incredible margin uh, since really you know, March or April of last year. And I think that that kind of scenario can continue until these real yields creep up. Now we're getting them to move slightly higher um, based on maybe a little bit of hawkishness. Um, we had Bostic on yesterday talking about how they could maybe taper uh, their bond purchases at year end, but nothing emphatic enough to really give big rise to them. So it, if you wanna watch any metric to, in terms of whether or not yields will be a problem and what could be a, uh, you know, in, a wind in the face of risk assets will be this real yield that's really been choppy and sideways for months here uh, on end. I just wanna to emphasize too that you're right that it does create a bit of a moral hazard and that when you have these real yields low it is like you know a license to speculate and things like zombie companies and SPACs and other you know highly levered and speculative vehicles really seem to take off in that environment and you're right the fed you know bostic talked about tapering there was a story i can't remember if it was in the ft or the wall street journal today that the Fed is starting to get a little worried about, you know, speculative forces in markets. And my first reaction when I read it is, yeah, you can jump up and down about it, but you, are you gonna actually do something about it? Are you gonna allow real yields to go up? I go, I don't mean like five basis points, no. So you're just gonna note, hey, look, we don't like what's going on, but we're not gonna change anything. So uh, we'll have to see whether or not it goes there. But yes, it is a form of speculation as well too. Jim, do you want to touch on nominal yields? Yeah, nominal yields, <clears throat> you know, that's the 10-year yield. That's just simply the 10-year yield. I'll come back to kind of my old saw here. They're rising. They typically rise on expected nominal growth. That's real plus inflation is nominal. Um, rising rates in and of themselves is not bad. Uh, it's why they're rising. They can rise for good reasons, they can rise for bad reasons. That's why I kind of reject this idea that people say, how high does the 10-year yield have to go before it bothers the stock market? Um, it could go, it does, that's not the issue. It's why is the 10-year yield going up? Now, if it's going up because real growth is booming and with real growth means more earnings and more jobs and everything else, that's a good reason and risk markets could continue to rally in the face of rising rates, or let's call that the reflation, reflation with real yields. If it's inflation, then that reduces purchasing power, reduces earnings, that could be a bad reason. I once quipped that economists all, in order to be an economist, you had to grow up watching Sesame Street, because last year was brought to you by the letters L, V, and then K, and this year is going to be brought to you by the letters <laughs> R and I, which is reflation and inflation. And so while we're starting off the year with a reflationary story raising rates, the market will be okay with that. But if that story morphs itself into an inflation story and it starts to affect real rates, I think the market's going to have a problem with that as we move forward from here. That's if we have inflation. Now that's a forward looking call. I believe we are going to get it. It's not quite evident yet. Check back in six or eight months and we can talk about whether or not we actually see more signs of it happening. 
Yeah, and I, the thing too with nominal yields is they're becoming increasingly connected to inflation expectations. So I know it's kind of a strange correlation, but let's take the 10-year nominal yield and we'll look at its correlation to the 10-year tips break even, or it's a 30-year to the 30-year. And that correlation is elevated. So in, inflation expectations are driving nominal yields by a larger degree than they have in the past number of years. And I think this is a good time, Kristen, we can go right into the third question, if that's okay. Sure, sure, because I well, wanted to touch on. Really, can I jump in real quick and mm -hmm. ask you a question, Ben? On your second chart, your swaption volatility chart. Yeah. What is swaption volatility or measure of nominal volatility essentially collapsing here in, in this? Is it just because we have low rates or what, what's going on here? So every time the Federal Reserve kicks in the gear, a new wave of stimulus or accommodation. You can see it with QE1, QE2, Operation Twist, all the way up until uh, we got the SMCCF and other programs. They've always been able to squash volatility and improve liquidity. And so this is the latest cycle of that. Uh, and as you have talked about, we have this you know, hugely growing balance sheet over seven trillion. Uh, something's happening worldwide and that's helped dampen volatility by a degree we really haven't seen since really a kind of operation twist um, and, and that environment. So where it seems that swaps and volatility has, has bottomed, uh, it's hard to tell on this chart, is, uh, but here you can see post-election swaps and volatility starting to rise. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the only way we're going to get an ample increase is kind of part of the story we're talking about. We need inflation and we need this uncertainty to come back because uh, swaps and volatility, just like many other things, is just a, you know, it's a premium that in, investors are demanding for taking the risk within the swaps market, you know, fixed or floating payments. And in this case, they're demanding still such low premiums because they have such a high degree of certainty in what the Fed is doing. Just like we showed with their, their certainty in their pessimistic outlook and their high degree of agreement. And again, remember the Fed is some of the, has some of the highest agreement, agreement, level agreement that they've seen in their history. That means that investors are comfortable and not yet concerned about the stories that we're talking about, inflation, um, uncertainty, maybe this is still the sluggish uh, job market. But um, I think there's some key measures we can all watch to determine when should volatility rise appreciably and when should we see this uncertainty? And this gets to this next, this third question, if we can dive right into that, Kristen. Sure. So the question is, is demand for inflation friendly asset and protection overdone? So this is what we're looking at is we have we've had this incredible rise in tips break evens. I think we have the short end of the tier space showing somewhere around 220 to 230 basis points, meaning that we're pricing in uh, this, you know, a higher, much higher degree of inflation that we have really, uh, you know, since the financial crisis itself. And if you, you say, fine, 2% is the hurdle that investors are getting comfortable with. If you look at, at the, um, vol the inflation swap caps and floors, another form of inflation expectations, they're pricing in 60, 70 plus percent probability that 2% headline CPI will be realized for the next two, all the way through 30 years. The next hurdle now is two and a half percent year over year. They're pricing that at about a 30% probability right now. You get to 50% across that curve, twos uh, throughout 30 years, even maybe a couple of them. That's when this inflation story really heats up. And that means that we're going to do something like Jim always talks about that we haven't done, which is get core inflation pulled up well above 2% um, and stay there. Not just from the base effects we'll see in April, but meaning that we'd see that endure uh, into year end. So it looks like right now, tips break evens have risen so much, they look overbought, tips look you know, overbought, um, but uh, with this dynamic of this 2.5% hurdle, I still think tips have an opportunity to outperform treasuries, even if real yields do rise going forward. One caveat, one word of caution that we've been talking about over the past number of weeks is that the tips break even curve itself has now gone flat to invert it. Um, and meaning that the difference between the two-year expectation and the 10-year expectation for headline CPI, or really tips break evens themselves, uh, has gone on its head. So the short run is running much hotter than the long run. And that's something that's going to put the AIT and the Fed to the test, um, because it's just something we haven't done in terms of going significantly inverted um, on that curve. What do you think, Jim? Yeah, I'd agree with you. You know, that Historically, where we are with real yields, and especially the, the, the break-even curve, and that's your last chart, that the two-year break-even rate is above the 
10-year break-even rate. And typically when that happens, inflation expectations are peaking and they should fall. And we should see that happen. And I would say, but as in all things in finance, oh, here's a, here's a, a relationship. And then you go, okay, but now that it's triggered again, the inverted curve means that tips should uh, peak. If they don't, and as you pointed out, Ben, let's give it to say the middle of February to find out whether or not that's the case. If it doesn't, it's significant in that it might be telling us a new regime might be underway, not just, oh, this indicator had a blown call. It could be much more important than that as well too. And we'll have to see which way it goes. But right now, with the way that the front end break even rates are really moving up, the, the inflation story is at least in tips land is getting, you know, really, really, you know, uh, hot. Now, yeah, I agree with you. We can pull back. That doesn't mean that tips are done as a decent investment, but um, they are <clears throat> getting a little bit uh, frothy of right now in relation to the shape of the curve. Any final thoughts today? Let me start with let me start with that. I think a lot of what we're talking about with real rates is really dependent on two things you need to understand. One is the Fed's heavy footprint in these markets right now, especially these these less liquid markets like the tips markets as opposed to the nominal normal treasury market and the outlook for inflation. And I want to emphasize that word outlook. It's not obvious that we have it. I've been making a case that we will get it and uh, we'll see what happens as the rest of the year unfolds. And again, like I said, whether or not we go from what the market thinks now we're going to have reflation and go to inflation later this year. So the tips market is going to be and the real rate market is going to be on the leading edge of that. And if we're going to see any changes in these dynamics, I think it's going to show up in those markets first. I think that's spot on. Uh, I think that real yields are one of the metrics you have to watch because they've just been, now I know if you pull them up on a chart or you find one, it's gonna look boring <laughs> over the past few months. Now, of course they plummeted um, you know, earlier uh, last year, but uh, whether or not they can finally rise is going to be the big clue as to what the Fed is doing. Uh, we can show pretty clearly through modeling that the Fed controls those real rates, like Jim talked about, they're even acting in them by buying tips. And if we can get those to pop, uh, then we have a story, and then we have one too that's going to rattle risk assets. And, and I think we'll get a really good clue, like Jim just said, via this tips break even curve, whether or not that stays inverted and how that looks through mid-February. Um, that could be kind of telling you what's going to happen with real yields uh, down the road. Bigger picture, uh, big time frothy, uh, overbought. I don't necessarily love tips uh, you know, on their own uh, right now, but I, I get the understanding that Fed's still in control. It doesn't seem like the downside's uh, high, but as, as a tips break, even relative to the nominals, they see, still seem pretty attractive uh, going into uh, the next number of months. Well, thank you both for your thoughts today and thank you for our audience for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For additional information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Thanks and have a great day.